Hello, and you are listening to Eco Justice Radio on KPFK Los Angeles and KPFT Houston. A project of SoCal 350 Climate Action, our show presents environmental and climate stories from a social justice frame featuring voices not necessarily heard on mainstream media. Welcome, I am Jessica Aldridge. On today's show, we are discussing Wolokota Buffalo Range, bringing back Tatanka, with host Carrie Kim, who will be interviewing guest Wheezy Pan Little Elk, who goes by Wheezy, and is the CEO of Rosebud Economic Development Corporation. Wheezy is a citizen of the Rosebud Sioux Tribe, where he serves as the CEO of the Rosebud Economic Development Corporation and its ecosystem of organizations that promote socioeconomic prosperity for the Lakota people of the Rosebud Reservation. Wheezy's previous experience includes political and legal work for a leading firm in Washington, D.C., and serving as the Deputy Chief of Staff to the Assistant Secretary of Indian Affairs at the Department of the Interior. He received his B.A. from Yale and his law degree from the University of Arizona. Wheezy and his team create solutions that will benefit the next seven generations. One such project is the Wolokota Buffalo Range. Thank you for tuning in to Eco Justice Radio and the show Wolokota Buffalo Range, bringing back Tatanka, with guest Wheezy Pan Little Elk and host Carrie Kemp. Aloha, my name is Carrie Kim, and today we're grateful to have Wheezy Pan, or Wheezy Little Elk, citizen of the Sichangu, Oyate, or Rosebud Sioux Tribe here, to speak about regenerating indigenous ecosystems, particularly the return of Tatanka, or bison, or buffalo, to their homelands on the plains. And before we begin, we would like to thank the Tongva ancestors, as our show comes to you from the ancestral lands of the Tongva people. Welcome, Wheezy. We are grateful and honored to have you on the show today. Thank you. I, I'm really excited, happy. We're, we're always thrilled to, to share our story. And I would just say, uh, Thank you. Uh, Thank you for for having me. I greet each and every one of you with a a good heart. And uh, and I said, my name is uh, Wizipra. I'm from the uh, Rosebud Sioux tribe. We call ourselves the Sichango Oyate. And my band uh, is the uh, We Wrap Our Hair Band. And and so (laughs) I want to always express our kind of a formal greeting. And then also just uh, this is a personal vow that I made this past year. Mm-hmm. That every time I heard a land acknowledgement, mm-hmm. that I would ask anyone who who heard the land acknowledgement to put some action behind yes. that land acknowledgement and make a small donation to a native cause of your choice, even a one dollar for every land acknowledgement we hear. And so, absolutely, uh, I become that guy. That no, but it ha- you're absolutely right. It has to go beyond <laughs> just the sort of the formality of it. It needs to be actually, like you said, the change that everyone says they want to see. So that's the only way that will happen. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, I was wondering if you could open by sharing the Lakota story, the creation story with listeners, so they better understand why Lakota people are Buffalo people. For sure. Yeah, that, that's something that we always talk about. It, it's something that we say and something that we believe in and are rooted in. And, and our traditional origin stories, the stories that talk about the creation of the world and the creation of humans and, the, and this third age that, that we're really living in right now. We, we say that, that at one point in history that uh, there were beings that, that lived on Earth and many different kinds of beings. We don't know what, what, what kind of shape or form or species they were, but that we were, we were a part of those beings. We were a group within there. Mm-hmm. And we were given instructions from the creator, from God, on how to live on earth, how to be good relatives to each other, mm-hmm. and how to uh, you know, live and work in peace and harmony. Unfortunately, many of those beings did not follow the instructions of the creator. 
And so the earth, our grandmother, Mother Earth and Creator, shook and there was fire and there was water and the earth opened up and and many of those beings were destroyed, mm-hmm. uh, consumed by the fire and the water. We were given specific instructions to go into a part of the earth that opened up mm-hmm. and to be taken in, you know, kind of back into to our mother, back into the womb and protected. And we lived there for a while. And uh, at another later point in history, we emerged. And there's kind of a whole series of kind of emergent story and, and mm-hmm. that goes along with that. But suffice to say that we came up from the earth. And, and when we came up, some of us were in human form. And then some of us became buffalo. Oh. And so for us, we have the same common ancestor. We're the same people mm-hmm. just have taken different, different, different forms. Form. And the purpose of the buffalo was to protect us, mm-hmm. to care for us, to teach us, and, and to provide for us uh, mm-hmm. as, as kind of this weaker kind of human form compared to mm-hmm. buffalo. Mm-hmm. And, and so, you know, we, we you know, they're, they, they've been everything to us, you know, to, to speak in Western terms. They were the economic base for our society you know, providing food, clothing, shelter, mm-hmm. spiritual items. They uh, were our teachers. Our, our society is actually modeled on Buffalo societies mm. um, in terms of their priorities and how they're formed and structured. Uh-huh. And they are our teachers, our spiritual teachers. They they provide instruction to us. And, you know, they, they figure very prominently in all of our, our kind of cultural and spiritual practices. Mm. Uh, so, so to say that we're Buffalo people, you know, literally means that we are Buffalo people. We're the same people. Yeah, the same people in two forms. Wow, that's, an, that's amazing. Thank you so much for sharing that story. I've never I've known of, of that entire story that you shared. And, you know, I wondered if you could also share with listeners maybe a brief history of bison or the buffalo on Turtle Island, because some people maybe don't know sort of about the extermination campaigns. And I, I think best for them to hear it from you, what that history has been to see where, what's happening now and why it's so poignant for them to be coming back. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. So, you know, around 1600, the low estimates is that there were 30 million Buffalo in, in North America. Mm-hmm. The high estimates is that there were 100 million. Call it 60, split the difference. And they had a, a, they ranged far and wide. You know, you, you had them in the North Carolina area, mm-hmm. all wow. the way to the Rocky Mountains, all the way down into New Mexico, Texas. Wow. And mm-hmm. all the way up into, you know, uh, the far reaches of Canada, up into, you know, Saskatchewan. And so that was all Buffalo territory. And they're very hardy animals. They can survive in many different, you know, pretty much any environment uh-huh. uh, in, in, in North America. So you probably had about, again, around 60 million animals in North America, uh, right around 1600. And, mm-hmm. you know, with westward colonial expansion, mm-hmm. those numbers began to, to immediately yeah. dwindle. By around 1800, we, we estimate there were probably around 60 million buffalo. And, you know, one of the, the, the first recorded buffalo kills that I think is very poignant is in 1804, 1803, 1804, in August of that year mm-hmm. is when Lewis and Clark recorded their first buffalo kill. And, mm-hmm. and that is about 200 miles from where I'm sitting right now wow. in South, South Dakota. And from that point forward, there's been a genocide was committed against buffalo. Yeah. And yeah. By the year 1900, you had less than a thousand free roaming buffalo. It Just un, six, I can't even imagine the slaughter. You know, 60 million to less than a thousand, and that extermination was deliberate. You know, there's there's you know many re, you know documented you know citations around that being the official policy of the U.S. government, and as you know, kind of Western colonial expansion. And, you know, there were a number of reasons for that. One was to get cheap hides and ship them back east. A little known fact, in many ways, the entire Industrial Revolution was built on buffalo because buffalo leather is superior. Uh-huh. So many of the actual, actual kind of machines that needed belt oh uh, my gosh, operate, they're actually using buffalo leather. At the same time, people really realized and understood that many indigenous people, including us in Dakota, 
relied, you know, almost exclusively on, on Buffalo for our food, clothing, shelter. Mm-hmm. And, you know, basically people said for every Buffalo you kill, you know, you're, you're helping to kill an Indian. And so that was also a, a very deliberate part of the strategy. And in, in some ways it worked in the sense that, you know, once there were no more Buffalo, that's what created the conditions for us that forced us onto the reservations. Were there actually kind of bounties for killing buffalo? Like you actually got money to kill buffalo because you were killing Indians? Is that also part of what the campaign was too? You know, I, I, there, 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 there may have been, you know, but, you know, a lot of what times would happen is, you know, you'd, you'd have uh, buffalo hunters go and, you know, kill anywhere from, you know, one to, you know, 30, 40 animals a day. And then they would go and, and harvest the tongue because uh, that's like some of the choices meat and then they'd skin the animal and take the hide and then that's it and just leave the carcass on the prairie to rot and then when there were no more buffalo and there were like bones everywhere then they gathered up the bones and you know use those for, for fertilizer ship those back east so it, it was a it was a pretty you know massive devastation when we've looked at the economic impact of of what that slaughter of bison meant over that hundred year period, we estimate that about two trillion dollars of oh wealth gosh. has been extracted from uh, the Great Plains tribes. Wow! Just in Buffalo, that doesn't include, uh, you know, the taking theft of land. That yeah. doesn't include, you know, any other kind of economic value. It doesn't include a value of our horses that were killed. And spiritual nothing. devastation, you know. Yeah. So, so that's just the, the economic value of the buffalo um, in, in today's dollars. So it, it was, it, it, it was, you know, it was kind of almost like two genocides, right? You know, one yeah. against the buffalo and then one against us. And then the other thing we don't talk about too often, too, is, is the, the vast changing of the landscape. Because oh. buffalo are a mm-hmm. keystone species to the plains prairie ecosystem. Mm-hmm. And in some areas of the country, you had grass that was six, seven feet tall and root systems that were, you know, six, seven feet down in the ground. Mm-hmm. And so uh, that served as a massive carbon sink mm-hmm. and, and, and prairie grassland ecosystems have a big role in, in, uh, in, in tackling climate change. Mm-hmm. And that was taken out. Then it went into cattle, into farmland. And then that, right. of course, that, led right direct result of the dust bowl yes. and, and the, you know that that was a direct result you know it doesn't just you know cause mm-hmm. and effect just not, doesn't happen in right. one year exactly you know? no 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 that's a grave consequence to the ecosystem all right can you speak about from here the the vision of the war lakota buffalo range and and also share about what the name means as well yeah yeah so the reason why we call it war lakota is is what, what essentially what it means is to live as Lakota, to 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 be Lakota, mm-hmm. and for again like for us, there's nothing more more Lakota than, than working with buffalo, right? <laughs> right? So that that that's the 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 reason behind that, and okay. you know overall the vision of of the the project is to be the first you know part of a new generation of kind of buffalo steward and land stewardship uh, in Mm -hmm. the Great Plains area. Mm -hmm. And, you know, one of the things I I talk about is, you know, I kind of talk about myself and and, and our people as as being 80th generation land and buffalo stewards, right? Uh And and for Uh us, as Lakota, we we can scientifically prove that we've been in the Black Hills region for for 2,000 years. So we can say we've been here for 80 generations. Right. Right, yes, yes work so so the buffalo range is uh, a 28,000 acre uh, regenerative buffalo range that will be home to uh, 1500 buffalo we're in year two of a five-year herd buildup mm-hmm. and uh, we lower somewhere around 150 plus animals uh, buffalo on the ground right now a significant part of this work really incl- is, is about re strengthening that relationship that we have with buffalo you know, mm-hmm. we do have existing herds, you know, here in the Great Plains 
that, that have been, you know, started in the 80s. And so this is a continuation of a lot of previous work that's uh-huh. been done. And how and, many were in those pre-existing herds? Are they much smaller or, you know? You know, you're, you're looking at anywhere from, you know, 50 to 400, mm. uh, most of them. One, one interesting fact is that our, when, when we're fully stocked, our herd will represent 7% of all Native American owned buffalo. Mm-hmm. At fifteen hundred, so on one hand, it's like uh-huh. you know, and, and at twenty thousand acres, we can say, yeah, that's kind of cool, uh-huh. uh, it's pretty big. But in but but in the big picture, Fancy we have a yeah. long way to go. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But it started, and it just seems like maybe it, is it just was it a matter of timing, or was there also? I know you've had this vision, and other native peoples of the plains have had this vision to bring the buffalo back. But is there also a prophecy that they would be coming back? So we, we don't have, at least for, for, from our, for, that I'm aware of, we don't have a specific prophecy around Buffalo, but we do have a prophecy generally around our, our people. And we call that, you know, seven gen. And, mm-hmm. and for us as Sichogu, our, our specific instructions based on, on spiritual vision of one of our ancestors is that there would be a period of decline. Mm-hmm. And, you know, he saw, the six, seven images, and the first image was large, you know, and it decreased in size, each successive image until the seventh one, and then that mm-hmm. was the largest, mm-hmm. and that became, and, and the interpretation is we would have a period of decline for six years, and then there would be the seventh, I don't know, six years, six generations, mm-hmm. the seventh generation would emerge yeah. stronger, more That's- vibrant, Mm-hmm. than all previous generations uh-huh yeah and for for that to happen a, a big part of that is is bringing buffalo back mm-hmm. returning them to their land returning them to their homelands giving them a place to live gr- live and grow and be who they are right uh, you know in the sense in the same sense that is is every human has a purpose uh, and and a plan they have a purpose too they need to be on land they have work to do I like to think that part of their work is combating climate change as a keystone species and in, mm-hmm. in reinvigorating and strengthening grassland prairie ecosystems. Well, so, and also I think the other thing about the biodiversity that the buffalo bring by being present on the plains is uh, amazing. When I was reading a, a little bit about it, I don't know if you could speak about that, but it's the other species, like you said, them being a keystone species, what else they change in the ecosystem when they're present. Absolutely. like, And, and I think, you know, and, and when the ecosystem, we often talk about, you know, kind of animals and then, you know, we talk about kind of the plants, right? And and so when when we've talked to a lot of people, they've said that after about three years, you're going to see a significant change in the biodiversity, especially okay. uh, from the animal side, yeah. increased numbers of animals. You're going to see increased predators and you're going to see you know the you know kind of predators come come back into balance Mm -hmm. and i think one of the other things that's that's really important is we typically see increased significant increase in the number of birds yes and the number of bird species Mm -hmm. you know from an anecdotal standpoint there are so fewer birds today than when i was a little boy and you know, that's backed up by data. I think it's like 70, 80% of the bird populations have declined over the last 40, 50 years. Mm-hmm. So that's, that's worrisome. Along with that, we're going to see increased plant diversity in terms of just kind of the number of species and the overall mm-hmm. health of those systems, which of course is going to, mm-hmm. you know, increase in a healthy way, insect populations. I think we're also going to see and then, you know, one thing I'm really interested to, to do is, is we, we do some pretty robust uh, uh, environmental monitoring. Uh-huh. But I really want to see how the microbial health the of the soil increases. Oh, I'm sure it's going to massively increase. We, uh, Weezy, we're going to take a break right here and then we'll come right back. Absolutely. Hey, listeners, quick break here. We hope that you're enjoying Eco Justice Radio. We air every Monday at 9 a.m. on KPFT Houston and every Wednesday at 3 p.m. on KPFK Los Angeles. Stay connected by subscribing to Eco Justice Radio on all major podcast apps and visit our website, ecojusticeradio.org, to check out previous shows and guests and get connected with us on social media. You are listening to Wolokota Buffalo Range, bringing back Tatanka. 
with guest Wheezy Little Elk, CEO of Rosebud Economic Development Corporation and host Carrie Kim. Watching the Wolakota video on the website, it just brought tears to my eyes to see some of the first of the herd that were being returned to the plains. And I'm wondering if you could also talk a little more about the Rosebud Economic Development Corporation. You know, it's an ecosystem of organizations, right, to promote yep. uh, prosperity for the Lakota people. I wonder if you could speak a bit more about what that is, how that came to be. Is that part of this, you know, seventh gen resurgence, yeah. empowerment? So please, yeah, please, if you could share with us what what's happening with Redco. Redco or Rosebud Economic Development Corporation is is a corporation owned uh, by the Rosebud Sioux Tribe, and where we serve as the arm, our economic arm of the tribe. And uh, really, what that is is an ecosystem of organizations taking a, a holistic approach to, you know, we we use the term economic development, but it's really about improving people's quality of life. Mm-hmm. At, the, at the heart of it, that's what it is. Mm-hmm. And one thing that we we often talk about is developing the the new Lakota economy mm-hmm. and and how do we fundamentally redefine wealth and orientate wealth back to making people's lives better. That's mm-hmm. ultimately what this is about. Mm-hmm. So you know we we get excited about this this work. And and so what, what Redco does is we own and operate a number of subsidiary businesses that do business on and off the reservation uh, mm-hmm. that generate profit for resources to for reinvestment, create jobs, uh-huh. uh, bust locally local monopolies on the reservation that have existed for years, uh-huh. and to overall strengthen our local economy so that we're turning more of those dollars over on our reservation. Uh, right now, out eight out of every ten dollars leaves our reservation, and, and you know if, if that's the case, we're not going to be able to build an, a strong economy. Eight out of every ten dollars is that because resources are purchased outside, or what is that? I mean, why is that? It is. You know, you you have a lot of businesses that that, that are off the reservation, so so we that's where we travel to to get a lot of our goods and services. At the same time, you know we've always taken a holistic approach, but I think it's also become very poignant that it's not enough to provide a good job for somebody and to create a good workplace culture with, you know, a full suite of benefits. You know, our, our minimum wage is 15, you mm-hmm. know, here we just said that we we're going to do that a, a few years ago because at the end of the day, the systems that we're living in, are what well, we say they're doing exactly what they, they were designed to do. Right. You know, the education system, the policy mm-hmm. was kill the Indian, save the man. The housing system, it was designed to, in the words of Roosevelt, serve as a great pulverizing machine to break up the Indian mass. It was still the 1970s when, you know, the Indian Health Service was doing forced sterilizations on women. And the slaughter of the buffalo led to our big dependence on treaty rations, with it, which then transitioned into, you know, kind of various government food programs. Right. Those systems have worked really well for what they were intended to do. And, and the result is, you know, high unemployment, low life expectancies and, you know, yeah. being at the bottom of every low you know, health outcomes. Right. Mm hmm. And then we also say, you know, so we've created a nonprofit entity that mm-hmm. does programming and all of those things. So, for example, we started a Lakota Language Immersion School. We just finished our first kindergarten class last week. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we have programming in all of those areas. We have a emerging community development financial institution. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, and then we, we do policy work. And so all of those work systems working together to create a better future and a better world for, for our people and region. So would you say this is more about becoming really 100% sovereign, you know, and just th- those programs really, you want to sever from those programs because they're not really designed to to help the people from a deep standpoint, you know, they're trying to keep you at, at a certain substandard level, I would say. This, this is about reclaiming our power, mm-hmm. reclaiming our self-sufficiency and our independence. And, and that is in many ways, you know, about reclaiming our sovereignty. We, we want to be the decision makers. Right. We want to be. the. And, and if we're going to have a grocery store and we're going to have unhealthy food in there, we want that decision to be our decision to have that. 
right. not anybody else's. Mm -hmm. And you know, we if we if we want to eat all buffalo, we should have that power. Mm -hmm. If we want to eat some buffalo and trade with others to bring in some salmon and wild rice, that mm -hmm. sounds awesome too. Mm -hmm. But let's make that let's make that conscious decision. Right. So right. that that's what this is about. And at the same time, we're doing good for people. We can also do good for the climate. You know, we we're we're about solving the two biggest crises facing our our humanity and the planet, and that's socioeconomic inequity mm -hmm. and climate change. Right. And those go hand in hand, and we can't solve one without solving the other. And what we talk about is is developing and implementing local solutions to global challenges. And you know, Wolakota is a great project for us, for our culture, for our people in our region. But what does the, the Wola Kota like project look like in Australia or in South America or in Asia? You know, mm -hmm. all of those. those all people. the indigenous peoples you're talking of the world. Yeah. Well, and, and not just indigenous people, but all people. This is the mm -hmm. kind of thinking that it's going to take to to solve these problems. So what happens if we have 10,000 more Wola Kota like projects all mm -hmm. across the globe? Yes. We can take a big chunk out of carbon emissions. We, mm -hmm. we, can, we can create a lot of jobs and opportunity and healthy mm -hmm. food. For people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But, but this is, you know, much more than just us, you know, here in, in Rosebud. This is about a global movement. Much bigger and, vision, yes, the global vision. Right? And last thing I'd say is if we can do this here on a Rosebud Indian Reservation, third poorest county in the entire United States, wow. we can do this anywhere. Mm hmm. So are other bands of Lakota, are they also doing the same thing or is this, are you kind of pioneering this, you know, amongst the Lakota people? Or I was wondering. There, there, there's been a lot of Buffalo work that's been done and, you know, we're, we're not the, the pioneers in terms of bringing Buffalo herds and establishing Buffalo herds on reservations that that's been done and, and we have to give credit to, to some of the folks, you know, here in Rosebud and all over the country. And and that work is happening and taking place. Mm -hmm. And and I think in many respects we're we're, you know, standing on the shoulders of giants. One of the things my mom talks about, you know, when is, is she always talks about the seventh generation mm -hmm. and, and this idea. And she's very adamant. She's like, son, you are not seventh generation. <laughs> You're sick, right? When we face our answer she says she says, your job your children. is to prepare the way. Mm -hmm. and, and I had a law professor who said, he said, you're, he said, our job is to go throw ourselves on the barbed wire fence so that you can crawl over me. Wow. And then you go throw yourself on the next barbed wire fence so somebody wow. can crawl over you. Mm -hmm. and, and that's what we're doing, mm -hmm. is, is doing our part with this generation to take the work that others have done and then scale mm -hmm. that up. Yes. So. They've established, you know, kind of a lot of cultural herds. Mm -hmm. Now we're, we're using our, our abilities from an economic standpoint, from a business right. standpoint, combined mm -hmm. with ethics and morality, mm -hmm. uh, from a business standpoint, to create and expand the work that they've done before. And so in that sense, I think we're probably one of the, the, the country's pioneers in this mm -hmm. sense to be able to, to create a herd of this size and magnitude that's going to accomplish what it does. And a success point for me will be when another indigenous nation comes along and mm -hmm. says, yeah, we like what you're doing, but we're going to do it three times bigger. <laughs> uh, that's great. Right. Right. That's yes. To me yes. is, is when, when somebody takes what we're doing and it says, we're going to do something even bigger, better, uh, mm -hmm. more and and that's going to I'm going to get so happy when that happens. Wow, yeah. It's kind of like leapfrogging the teacher kind of a thing but 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 scaling it up like you said. As you had said that in, in an interview with World Wildlife Federation you had said or World Wildlife Fund you had said that the um, the bison will also usher in the return of Lakota values. Yeah, the buffalo are our teachers and one one of the things we always talk about is when there's a threat the herd unites. Mm. And the calves are placed in the, in the center. And then around the calves are the older animals. Uh -huh. And then around them are the cows. And then the outer ring is formed by the bulls. Mm -hmm. And wow. they, they kind of, 
they, 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 they say our children and our elders are most important. Mm -hmm. So they're at the center and nothing is going to get through to them. Uh, we will, we will, we will protect. Mm -hmm. And what happens if we create society where children and the institutions serving children and elders and the institutions serving elders are the most important institutions of, in our society. Yes, as it should be. I mean, we've witnessed a lot, of course, through the pandemic and what's happening at both scales with elders and children. You know, it's been pretty devastating in the last, you know, almost year and a half. If you could speak also about how you envision having this small scale meat processing operation and what it means to actually have you know, grass-fed, humanely raised, and um, an animal that is slaughtered with dignity and honor, prayer, you know, what that what that looks like, you know, what your vision is for that. And would that only just remain on the reservation or, or what is the vision? So you kind of mentioned the pandemic. And I think that that, you know, is, is a perfect, you know, example of the, that our work is not only important, but urgent. And the you know the the breakdown of some of our existing systems, including you know our our meat processing systems, and how how vulnerable they are. And mm -hmm. one of the part of the solution is to decentralize that mm -hmm. and to create you know smaller scale meat processing facilities. Mm -hmm. And we finished the feasibility study, and we have a business plan, and we're going to make a decision. Uh, soon in terms of if that's something that we want to move forward with oh, okay but if we do it will allow us to become a regional producer because to to you know always talking in economic terms but to break even on a project like that is going to require a lot more animals than we currently uh -huh. have from okay. buffalo standpoint well it'll also need necessarily include cattle um mm -hmm. which can be a good thing when done right okay. so what that will allow us to do is is to make the decisions to be in the seat of power where we get to kind of define our own destiny mm -hmm. while at the same time creating opportunities for the region and improving the whole region. And, mm -hmm. you know, from a food standpoint, we need to, to begin thinking more regionally as opposed to nationally and sourcing our materials, our food mm -hmm. locally. You know, that's going to be a big, big, important part of, of tackling climate change and, and mm -hmm. social inequity. So we can create those regional food systems through projects like this. So that, that that's going to be, be, be an important part of our work. Right. Well, you would I think you had said that the, the plan is, you know, that those that the bison would be fed to the children in the schools. Correct. We one of the Buffalo. unique things that. One of the unique things about the buffalo herd is is we've set a certain percentage of the herd aside for herd shares, which, uh -huh. which you know, kind of the local institutions or others can purchase a part of a herd share. Uh -huh. uh, we'll share crop that herd, and then those animal the, the whoever owns that herd share can either sell those back to us or they can continue to own that herd share and then harvest an animal or however many animals they, they've, they've acquired mm -hmm. on an annual basis. And mm -hmm. so one of the first things we did was set up a herd share for our sister nonprofit to benefit our school children so uh -huh. that every year the school children will be able to harvest, I forget how many buffalo, but they'll be right. able to have buffalo in their diet on a weekly basis. Yes. I mean, I can only imagine what their diet has been on the, you know, food program. I can, it's like, it's horrific. And across, you know, Turtle Island, what children are fed in school. Yeah. So, you know, we, we've, we did one traditional harvest and it was really cool because, you know, we have a food sovereignty initiative. They led that. We harvested an animal, did it in a traditional way. Um, but we brought in the school kids to participate. It was mm -hmm. it was outdoors, you know, so mm -hmm. we had to be COVID safe and you yeah. know, social yeah. distancing. But, yeah. but what, what the school was then able to do is turn that into an entire month's work of project-based learning. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so the kids, you know, and they're kindergartners, right? Right, <laughs> so five, right. Five yeah. year old. And, <laughs> but, but each one of them had this whole project of like, this is how you harvest the buffalo. And this is everything that you do with the parts of the buffalo. And and then they did this cool little presentation thing. Um, they remember but, uh, those things, you know, those impressions of your early years. I mean, those are things that stay with you. 
there are these seeds planted, you know? And, uh, and, and that's a part of, I think that's where the magic happens. Cause we can talk about numbers and economics. We can even talk about cool stuff with climate change. But when you talk about those human stories, those individual stories, I think it, it, it becomes so much more powerful because mm-hmm. like you said, those kids in their consciousness now, it's not about, oh, you know, maybe I'll harvest a buffalo someday right. if they've done it. And, it, and, and now their consciousness is going to be about the next time. Mm-hmm. And they're going to know more about what to do and how to do it. And, and that's where bringing back our language and our culture and our spirituality is and, and, and really just revitalizing the entire community. Yeah, that, that's where all the magic happens. A hundred percent. I mean, the food is the hugest part. As we know, just like with the extermination of the, bi- of the buffalo on that standpoint, was a way to, you know, kill off Indians by bringing back the food source. It's, it's symbolic on so many levels, you know, not just physical sustenance, but on so many levels, there's sustenance coming from, from the, the food source, whatever that is. You know. so f- food is medicine and mm-hmm. how it's prepared and where it comes from matters. And, you know, the, the stronger, closer relationship we have with food is, is going to make us more human. Right. You know, and, and it doesn't matter, you know, what, what, what your approach is. If you eat meat, then you should have a relationship with that meat. If you, you know, vegetarian, you know, growing, understanding how to how to grow and raise that food is, is incredibly mm-hmm. important. Hey, listeners, quick break here. We hope that you're enjoying Eco Justice Radio. We air every Monday at 9 a.m. on KPFT Houston and every Wednesday at 3 p.m. on KPFK Los Angeles. Stay connected by subscribing to Eco Justice Radio on all major podcast apps and visit our website, ecojusticeradio.org, to check out previous shows and guests and get connected with us on social media. You are listening to Wolokota Buffalo Range, bringing back Tatanka. With guest Wheezy Little Elk, CEO of Rosebud Economic Development Corporation and host Carrie Kim. I wanted to just comment about Bill and Melinda Gates. I'm sure you probably know, well, Bill Gates, I guess at this point, given their divorce, but but um, has become the largest, you know, owners of farmlands in Turtle Island. And they're big advocates of synthetic meat. You know, and while we know many people today embrace, you know, plant-based diets and they want to avoid killing of animals, I just wondered if you could speak to, you know, being a hunter yourself, being someone who is, this is part of your tradition and it's much more than just killing an animal. There's a whole relationship. Can you speak to what it means to to actually consume the meat of a buffalo? Can you help listeners understand what is that sacred relationship? What is that about? So. We have a, a part of our, our creation story after we came up out of out of the earth and some of us were buffalo and some of us were human. There became a period where the buffalo began to eat humans. Mm. And so we prayed to the creator and for help. And so there was uh, the creator called all of the animals, the birds, the humans, every, everybody, four legged and said, we're going to have a race around the Black Hills. And if the two legged win then they will eat the four leggeds and if the four leggeds oh. win then they will eat the two legged. <laughs> and thankfully the bird nation, the birds sided with the humans because they had two legs. Uh-huh. And uh, <laughs> without getting to too many details of, of the story, the birds ended up winning the race for humans. Wow. For uh. <laughs> and so uh that became the order of, of uh-huh. nature. Mm-hmm. And for us we have to we have to harvest buffalo to be ourselves and buffalo have to be able to provide themselves to us in order for them to be who they are mm-hmm. and so for us it's not just it's it's more than an emotional relationship it's more than you know spiritual it's it's it's, it's you know metaphysical and central to our identity as Lakota. right it's like a cosmological view it, Right. It, it is. And who knows, maybe in a different age that will change. But mm-hmm. but for right now, that's that's how our, our world is 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 viewed and, and our world is structured. Mm-hmm. And I think that it, it's important for every people, every member of society, indigenous or, or not, to come to those conclusions themselves for what that means to them. 
at the same time to be respectful mm-hmm. uh, of indigenous people. And you know what? I, I say this sometimes. We've been screaming at the top of our lungs for 200 years about in the industri- in industrialization and what's happening to the planet. It is really interesting. I went back sitting bull in the late 1800s, you know, after traveling the world, he remarked, the white man knows how to make everything, but does not know how to distribute it. Uh, so, so he was talking about social inequity, mm-hmm. you know, back in the 1800s, you know, and, and, and you know, Chief Seattle is, is said to have, you know, famously said, you know, continue to defecate in your own bed and you're going to suffocate. Right. Uh, so, mm-hmm. you know, that that's climate change. That's mm-hmm. pollution. Mm-hmm. So if we're going to tackle these big problems, the world and world leaders are going to have to come to indigenous people and say, you know what? We kind of messed up the world. Uh-huh. You guys have been pr- proposing solutions for a couple hundred years. We're ready to work with you and we're ready to begin listening to what some of those yeah. solutions And are. have you lead. Let's say that. Let have you lead. I'd like to read a quote from you, Weezy. We have always believed that bringing back the buffalo is important, but the pandemic shows that it is urgent. We are all talking about food security and what the new normal is going to be. We at Rosebud have to get back to our roots and provide an example for the rest of the world. So could you speak a little bit more about what is happening, if there's anything more to share about the food sovereignty that you envision? Maybe there's more even beyond the buffalo that you're working with there. Uh, Absolutely. So the the buffalo part is is just one component of a much larger food sovereignty initiative. Mm -hmm. We, that, that really operates at, you know, kind of the, the, the family level, community level, and at the macro level. We, you know, the group, you know, recently, our Food Sovereignty Initiative, you know, last year won an award from the uh, Rockefeller Foundation as, as being one of the top 10 most innovative kind of food projects in the world. Uh, wow. We're, uh, only one of two North American recipients of this kind of innovation wow. award. Mm-hmm. And and so, you know, we uh, have a lot of kind of community scale programming where we teach in we're the, we're the largest employer of, of youth and interns uh, on our area in our area. We do a lot of teaching. We have uh, a fellowship program where people come and learn how to be producers. We do cooking classes. We have indigenous food programming. We have, believe it or not, the, the third largest farmer's market in the entire state of South Dakota. Wow. Um, mm-hmm. So, so in a, kind of a, a, a small food movement has, has begun to grow here. Same time, uh, we also have 1,800 acres of organic uh, farm production uh, that we operate. Uh, we're doing wow. some, a good little chunk of that is going to be hemp this year. Um, uh-huh. but, but the whole idea is that from an from a individual, family, community, and, and kind of larger scale, we are going to to create and develop and implement, you know, those food systems that are going to be self-sustaining mm-hmm. and feed the region, mm-hmm. uh, you know, while at the same time building healthy relationships with the food and doing what our part to manage our lands mm-hmm. and not, you know, not only a sustainable way, you know, people talk about regenerative ag, right. but really what we're talking about is indigenous ag. Mm-hmm. Which, which I think is a is a step up and in, in a different level right. Of, right. of thinking. Tell so, me the, the how you see that. You know, you know when you say like it's a step up. Obviously, there's like spiritual component, cultural component. Can you speak to that? How you see that as a step up? That's kind I, of I the best word right now. Yeah. So, I, I, one in regenerative ag in some ways you know, gives nods to indigenous ag, uh, mm-hmm. but I don't think enough. I think that indigenous agriculture is, is really the, the mother of what people call regenerative agriculture. And so it's really about reestablishing, you know, not only just, you know, kind of science, science-based, you know, land right. management practices. Ecology and, yeah, mm-hmm. that, you know, that, that, that that's a part of it, but it's really more about building community and in, in a relationship with the land. I had an uncle who, you know, during, you know, I, during the pandemic and I was like, uncle, like what, what's, what's your recommendations uh, about everything? 
you know, with the pandemic and, and what, what do we do? And, and he said, you know what, uh, nephew, he said, back in the 80s, he said, we had some leadership from one of the, the big environmental organizations come out to Rosebud and meet with people. And, you know, they asked them what we needed to do to heal the climate and the planet and all that. And they said, you know what, Earth is, is going to take care of herself. Mm-hmm. What we need to focus on is treating people good. Mm-hmm. He said, if we treat people good, everything else is going to fall into line. And so that's a big part of this is be, is, is, is tackling the, the social aspects, the human aspects. Okay. of this. Mm-hmm. And from a Lakota perspective, if we lean into to who we are, we consider everyone and everything to, to be a relative, mm-hmm. which means that, that we, you know, we have to show and give, you know, the rest of the universe, the same kind of dignity and respect that we would any other person. Right. And leaning into those ideals, leaning into, you know, ideals of, and systems of, you know, what we call seven generation thinking and processes is, is going to be incredibly important. So I well, think I, you know, I, have, I have to say the world owes a debt to the native peoples of the world, because I can't even imagine, you know, this world without that, that essence of wisdom that is about connection and community and taking care of one another and like you said, looking down um, seven generations, looking that realizing that there even is a generation after yourself, you know, to take care of. You know, one thing I wanted to also ask you is after the 1500 um, bison or buffalo are initially established, you spoke that your vision was that there's like a bigger vision of a million acres. Uh, could you speak a little bit about that? Like beyond the 1500, what happens now? I mean, it just seems like it could just really propel this movement of bringing back many, many, many more bison over time, you know, millions, literally. Yeah. So, so I, I think that, that we have this, this massive opportunity right now at this moment in history to, to take like the model that we've done with Wolakota and greatly expand it across multiple native nations. Uh-huh. And, and I think that if we had a goal of getting to a million acres of buffalo restored lands restored to the exclusive use of buffalo that there would be so many social economic benefits to that and i think that one of those benefits would be that we can bring in native nations as a key partner you know in this kind of 30 by 30 movement and that, I don't know, i'm sorry i don't know what that means the 30 so, by 30 movement. So, so 30 by 30 is, you know, something that's been put out by, by a number of organizations. And I think that including the current administration where 30% of our lands are put into conservation. Ah, uh, um, yeah. Okay. I know what you're talking wildly. about. Yes. Uh huh. Yes. Yes. So, so, so what if in the Great Plains region, in the Plains regions, <clears throat> we take lands, we restore them to Buffalo use, mm-hmm. you will see an economic value returned from those buffalo herds you will see jobs created yes. increasing our healthy food systems mm-hmm. while at the same time restoring those ecosystems to original grassland prairies okay. and yeah. join the hydrological and, uh, cycle yeah, the, 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 I, I can't imagine or think of or even design in the great plains area a better way to accomplish all of those goals Mm-hmm. And, and I think that that's the beauty and the wonder and the, and the magic of this kind of yeah. work. Is it already I mean, happening? I mean, there are already conversations around that, about aligning together to, to conserve a bigger areas. I mean, I know there's the American Prairie Reserve. I don't know how many, how much, how much acreage that is, but. I, you know, I, I think those ideas have been around for a while. I think it's time to include indigenous people and native nations in those conversations. Uh, you know, because at the end of the day, those have been lands that, that have been stolen from us. And yes. we know how to best manage those lands. Mm-hmm. And projects like Wolakota demonstrate that we can not only manage those lands in a far superior way, mm-hmm. but we can also turn an economic and create economic benefits mm-hmm. from, from it as well. Mm-hmm. So uh, I think it's just win, win, win across the board. I mean, I think we know that the the momentum is only going to go in that direction. It feels like that. I mean, that is 
sort of the seventh generation, isn't it? Prophecy about the resurgence of indigenous peoples. I mean, many of us know there will be, it will be the indigenous leading the way because the human beings will not survive without indigenous peoples um, reclaiming all of their sovereignty, ancestral ways, that core essence of living with uh, Mother Earth and everything interdependently. Yeah, I think it's time. And, you know, one of the things that I, you know, I have a, a website I talk, you know, where it's called Native Save the World, where I put a lot of my, my writing and ideas on. About can this. you say that again? It's Native, Na- Native Save the World. And this is a website? Yeah, just, I just throw my, I have ideas in writing and I just throw it up there, you know, not. It's uh-huh. not, more right, like, it's right, not, right. not just a blog, but, <laughs> right. but it's just to get some of those ideas out mm-hmm. there, you know, where That's we can, wonderful. you know, where we can talk about we've talked about the relationships and, you know, my mother or my grandmother used to say, watch what you think, because you can have an impact on a star in another galaxy. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, you know, people will kind of scratch their head and, you know, yeah. Right. <laughs> but if you were to go ask the smartest scientists and human beings in the world mm-hmm. and have them explain quantum mechanics and right. quantum yes, science yes, yes. and the ability to, for, for, you know, <laughs> things to be in two states of simultaneous existence in two different galaxies at the same mm-hmm. time, mm-hmm. all of a sudden it doesn't sound so crazy. Right. And, no, and no. so when, when science catches up to indigenous knowledge, right. that is, I think, when we're going to see an entire new age for collective humanity. And, and I think we have, we have kind of, we have a choice to make. Right. Are, are we going to move forward collectively as, as, as a species and value each other um, and create a better world for future generations? Mm-hmm. And, or are we going to, to, you know, continue towards warming the planet and, and fighting over resources? Those are, are, are some big choices that, that we have to make. And so I think we're trying to do our part to show what, what is possible. Right. Well, I mean, I know, uh, of course, indigenous people are going to lead the way. I, that's that's what I'm, I feel in my heart and, and have known for a while. You know, just so many, so many things point to that. And we know that needs to happen. I, I wonder if you have any thoughts about things. It's kind of a little bit, a little bit dark shift to talk about this, but we know that things are happening with biotechnology. They are um, genetically modifying pigs now. They are genetically modifying mosquitoes. Uh, that's also kind of like this dark side rising up too. And I wonder if you have any comments on that. And, and also, you know, of course we have to preserve the genetics of the Buffalo and they are soon going to be patenting animals. I wonder if you have any comments on all of that. So w- one of the things that when we talk about like seven gen is, you know, there, I think there's really three principles to this one act in the best interests of your great grandchildren's great grandchildren Two make moral and ethical decisions that benefit the collective group over the individual. And then three, embrace systems of systems, complex thinking. So we have to use all available information and data to make, make those decisions. And a really simple way of, of thinking about all of that is asking the simple question, not can we do something, right? but should we do something? Mm-hmm. You know, we know that we can clone a human being and right. you know, do all kinds of crazy stuff with science, but should we? Mm-hmm. And to answer that question, we have to go back to, to morality, ethic, and then use all of the available systems of systems, thinking and data to, to inform that decision. And I can't tell you if we as Lakota should establish a colony on Mars. It's going to happen. <laughs> I don't right. know if we should do that. Um, (laughs) right you know know, within a decade decade, we're gonna have people on mars yeah i I mean it just feels like that's kind of the continuation of the exodus and the running from europe to here from the you know going just continuing to run from if we cannot make a, a life here because there's enough here that you wouldn't need to go to mars you know if we really took care of the lands took care of each other other than curiosity, what would be the need to go there? Let's make sure our house is clean before we, we, exactly. we move into another house. <laughs> exactly. And that's what it is. It's just perpetuating a cycle of running. It's like not taking care of um, the wake behind us. 
and then trashing the next new place, trashing Mars. I mean, it's, it's just going to be repeated is what I feel like, you know, we didn't learn our lesson. But um, Wheezy, I wanted to uh, see if it has been an incredible, incredible gift to have you on the show today. And I wonder if you could share some of the ways people can be in touch with Wolakota or contribute to the project in any way. Um, what what are ways that people can stay in contact with you and, and what's happening where the, you the are? Easiest- the, the easiest way is, is to go over to is, is to um, go to rosebudbuffalo.org. And, uh, you know, we keep update of information there. You see videos and pictures. Um, if, if somebody wants to support financially um, mm-hmm. or get a hold of us to mm-hmm. learn more, they can, they can do that all through, through rosebudbuffalo.org. Okay, that's fantastic. Yeah, and I, I do, just listeners, I wanted to let you know, we've been using the word, you know, I asked Weezy in the beginning of the sh- uh, out, off offline about buffalo and bison, and we, he uses the term interchangeably. And so we've just been using the term, you know, buffalo a lot in the show. And, and again, that's like back to what you're saying about science versus sort of spirituality. And really, it's, it's, <laughs> it's in yeah, the name, you know, yeah. yeah. We, yeah. we call them Tapanka, and, and so that's what it is to us. But Yeah. Tatanka. Thank you so much, Weezy. We're so grateful. And, and we hope that um, we can bring you back on the show as things continue to, to progress and as new ideas get manifested and come into being to, to really change this world back to a harmonious place. Thank you so much. I, I, I enjoyed it and, and appreciate it so much. Thank you, Weezy. And thank you to your ancestors for all the wisdom that they have you know, blessed you with and that continues to to bless our world. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to our guest today, Wheezy Little Elk, and thank you to our listeners for joining us. This has been Wolokota, Buffalo Range, bringing back Tatanka. Please connect with us on social media at EcoJustice Radio, SoCal 350, and Adventures in Waste. And if you like what you heard and you want others to be informed, subscribe to that podcast, share the episodes, and help us continue our efforts. You have been listening to Eco Justice Radio on KPFK Los Angeles and KPFT Houston. A project is SoCal 350. This show can be found on kpfk.org, kpft.org, all major podcast apps, and at ecojusticeradio.org. Created by Mark and J.P. Morris, executive producer Jack Eye, producer and co-host Jessica Aldridge, co-host Carrie Kim, engineer Blake Lampkin, and original music by Javier Cadre. And until next time, remember, the power is yours.